our own space programs, and I'm going to tell you about those later on, but for now, I want to deal with something that a very famous writer, Neil Gaiman, learned. So there was a time not too long ago when China, despite having all this technological prowess, engineering prowess, scientific prowess, they banned science fiction. It's an authoritarian country. They called science fiction cultural pollution. Well, something changed in their government. So this man, very famous fantasy writer, Neil Gaiman, author of American Gods and many other things, he went to China to appear at one of their major science fiction conventions. And he asked his government handlers, what has happened here? Because I know you used to ban this stuff, and now you are leading with major science fiction conventions and maybe have more science fiction readers than any country in the world. So his handler, gave him a very straightforward response. He said, look, we discovered in China that we were good at imitating things, technology from other countries, but we were not producing inventors. So we sent a team of researchers, sociologists and others, to Silicon Valley. And they asked all those inventors, all those innovators, what is the secret to your success? And people didn't necessarily know. So they asked more and more questions, and they discovered that the common thread was that all of those people, Apple and Google and IBM and Microsoft and all these other people, they had one thing in common. They had all grown up reading science fiction, and almost all of them were still reading science fiction. The lesson is clear. If you want to create the future, you better start dreaming it right now. Now probably, you know, I've been talking with, with Jane and with our MC and a lot of other people here, and it has thrilled me to meet so many African Canadians right here, including my generation, who love science fiction and fantasy. When I grew up, there were a lot of times that I met I couldn't find other Africans who love science fiction, and so, all we got was the traditional things that we were quote unquote allowed to be interested in. Not things that are bad, just things that weren't my particular cup of tea. So it was only athletics that could be discussed. Or it was only this form of, uh, of uh, being a smooth love daddy in the nightclub. That was okay, you could aspire to that. But what you couldn't do is talk about technology, space, robotics, alien life. So, as we just learned why, it's absolutely important that we have that conversation. Because science fiction explores how people confront the opportunities and the crises of their era. And we know we've got plenty of crises. We've got environmental difficulties, medical difficulties. We've got a major difficulty living inside of the White House. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm not elected, I can say anything. These are crises that threaten human civilization. And if we do not come up with our own solutions, we will be the victim of somebody else's final solution. So what we need to do is we need to start running these mental models of what we want to build, create, and we need to draw upon all those people who are already doing brilliant, dynamic things right now. So, the definition of science fiction also includes that we understand that the dominant emotion that it produces is awe. Now, you know, a lot of the ways that we have been taught to regard history is in mourning, to be sad about crimes that were done to us. And this is particularly, it's important to mourn how we were oppressed. But if somebody captures your historical mind so that it is only 400 years long, then you will end up believing that somebody else's crime committed to you is your history rather than an interruption of your history. in the bellies of ships. We were born upon and along the River Nile and raised the pyramids to the stars. So science fiction awakens some of these 
values and, and visions in us because when we have all, when we are inspired with wonder, we understand greatness and we're not humbled. Instead, we stand proud. So, as we continue on here, I just want to make a little academic note here. Fantasy is important, but fantasy doesn't deal with the actual scientific things that we can create. It can still inspire all, it can still be beautiful. But what we're going to look at tonight in Afrotopianism is these thought experiments. When you can imagine right now, and create it on your computer or in your community organizations, what the future is going to look like. Because the best way to be successful in the future, of course, is to make it a future of your own design. So what is Afrotopianism? By the way, the um, the uh, projectors are not quite aligned. There's only one F in Afrotopianism. <laughs> and you, you do not need your eyes checked. I'm just letting you know that right now. So, okay, so some people say the word Afrofuturism. I might even have sent that word in my advanced notes, but I am now using this word that I've created, Afrotopianism, for a very specific reason. The, the, the term Afrofuturism, in fact, wasn't invented by an African. It was invented by a Euro-American critic, and you know, it's a, it's a nice word, but notice something. By saying Afrofuturism, it eliminates the present and all of the past. And of course, the project to destroy us and to exploit us was predicated on denying all of our past, to teach us that we're not even Africans, and so that some of us can go our whole lives without ever calling ourselves Africans. That's destroying a past. Because the way that colonialism works is, you go to somebody else's country, you name yourself after the country, and you call those people natives. Aborigines, those are imperial terms that mean people we conquered. When you name yourself after their land, you're saying, no, we're the boss here, it belongs to us. And that's why there's a country called Canada and a country called America and Australia. It is somebody going to take somebody else's land. And that's why when you take a trip to Europe, you don't call those people natives, but they are, right? <laughs> So when we reclaim that word Africa, when we stand tall with all of the great brilliance of more than 5,000 years of history, literacy, science, and architecture, then suddenly we say, if we did all that then, what can we accomplish in the next 5,000 years? So an Afrotopian says, like the word utopia, a dreamed of place of, of our greatest ideals, Afrotopia says this is the place. We do not lose our past because we draw all of it. We build it in the present and we make the future. And that's why I'm an Afrotopian and an Afrotopian writer. So Afrotopianism, a lot of you might not realize you're already experiencing it in so many ways. So for instance, we see it in our music, film and television, art and comics, and books. I just want to show you some of the music you might not have known of that, that you've already been enjoying. Sun Ra. A lot of you jazz fans in the room might have heard of Sun Ra. Sun Ra was one of these people, he, he didn't just make music, he played a character, like those wrestlers who stay in character for decades, they're called kayfabe. This is what he did. He said he was from an angel race from the planet Saturn. But you can see in the clothing and in the design here that Sun Ra was actually saying that he was Egyptian. Now some of you grew up with images like uh, the Ten Commandments and Elizabeth Taylor and Cleopatra and got told that the ancient Egyptians were actually Norwegian. But of course they were Africans and so people like Sun Ra were embracing that. If you look at Parliament Funkadelic, I'm sure there's a few Pete Funk fans in the house. Okay. You can see them right there. They are embracing space travel. And even the, the mothership over there, with the, the actual mothership, this massive prop, is now in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, recognized as a great cultural treasure. And for those of you who go really deep, how many of you have read the autobiography of Malcolm X? So an awful lot of you. So I even wrote a whole article, you can catch it on io9, the website, that says, that shows that the mothership wasn't just a neat, fun convention for Parliament Funkadelic, it's actually rooted in the ideas of the Nation of Islam. Now I'm not, rep I'm called Minister Faust, but I'm not from the NOI. But I'm just telling you, that's what it's rooted in, that we have all these ideas permeating so many aspects of our cultures. Again, there's the mothership as it appeared on stage. 
earth, wind, and fire drawing upon the future, our ancient architecture has traveled to the stars, as well as, of course, drawing upon our ancient civilization, or one of them. X clan. Uh, public Enemy, this is from a video, Do You Want to Go Our Way? You should see the entire thing. Um, many of us remember this great uh, video with uh, Eddie Murphy as a pharaoh, and uh, Michael Jackson, of course, and uh, the Somali model, Iman. And this was directed by John Singleton. Until this time, I had never seen Africans play the ancient Egyptians, and a whole bunch of us across North America saw this on Much Music or MTV, stood up and cheered. And some other folks said, why are you cheering? I said, we know why we're cheering. <laughs> okay, today, Kelly's doing an, her, one of her albums, uh, a techno album, and exploring the, the techno fusion with the body. Uh, the great artist, Janelle Monet, uh, her work is extremely science fictional, Afrotopian. Uh, a terrific song by uh, Nas and Damien Marley called Patience. If you haven't seen the video, look it up. And by the way, Right now, use the tech you've got. Take out your cell phones. You can take pictures of every single frame I'm showing you because I want you to look stuff up. I want you to find this for yourselves and build your own after open library. Film and television. My father's family is from, I'm from Kenya, through my father. Uh, this is a, uh, years ago, this is a Kenyan science fiction movie. You know, we, we happen to be thinking over here that of course in the motherland we're making science fiction. This is an ecological, dystopian science fiction film by a sister from Kenya, who is a director and a writer. A writer from Nigeria, a, 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 a film, uh, Oya, Rise of the Orishas, drawn upon the ancient Nigerian as well as Benin gods. So we're combining various aspects of our histories and our cultures. You can get these web series right now, when you go home, hopefully not watch them while I'm talking to you, which is uh, the superhero series right on the web, Keloid and CV Nation. You can also catch on my podcast, my interview with the, one of the creators of CV Nation. Before Marvel and DC were getting their superhero series on the air, uh, we had our folks doing theirs, and they've been doing great work. Slight, another terrific Afrocentric superhero movie. Uh, many of you, who knows Luke Cage? Yeah. You actually know Luke Cage, personally. Okay, that's good to know. So anyway, um, and, and Misty Knight, and then Black Lightning. A lot of you probably in the room Black Lightning fans. So we're seeing, and of course, the great Black Panther. Amazing, amazing feat of imagination. And you know, for years, some of us in this room are old enough to remember the early 1990s when the only films that we could see of ourselves were in the hood movies. Hollywood was giving us lots of money to show us killing each other, harming each other, even very recently, the Straight Outta Compton movie. Those of us who grew up in the, that era of hip hop remember just how villainous people like Dr. Dre were in real life, beating a woman named uh, uh, Dee Barnes, who was a sister, who was a journalist, and their horribly misogynistic music. Hollywood gave them the money to make that movie, but then, Somehow, Hollywood gave our brother, the director, Ryan Cooper, the money to make this movie. All right? Now, which vision do you want? All right? So, this goes to show you when you see a Wakanda future that is so advanced that it's not just technologically advanced, it's also morally advanced. Their capital city, you notice? No cars. They wanted a city that was ecologically balanced. You notice that it's the most feminist movie of any action or science fiction movie ever made? African women as great leaders in every sphere? Wonder Woman should hang her head in shame looking at that movie. Again, the capital city right here, the technology, and you know, I just cheered when I saw that even the bottom of their spaceship, you turn it up, their aircraft, and it is a mask. Right, from our aesthetics. So, uh, and then also some use of this in order to tell grimmer stories, the stories of our exploitation, like this brilliant movie Get Out, and I'm happy to say that the, uh, the director, um, what? Yeah, from Key and Peele, what am I, what, what's his name? Jordan Peele, thank you, is now gonna be making multiple movies and TV series, all right? So we keep on going. We see this. Uh, sorry to bother you. Some, anybody here see this one? Okay, so it's an Afrocentric film that deals with labor struggle and it also deals with um, uh, well, the, the transformation of the body. So the exploitation of the body. Fascinating film, another Afrocentric visionary. But it's not just us who've made these. We also see that uh, our characters have had a big impact on other science fiction. Lieutenant Uhura. 
Some of you might even know that the actress, Michelle Nichols, she got sick and tired after one year on the show because she wasn't getting any lines. And she had to put up with William Shatner. <laughs> so, somebody, a fan of the show, begged her to stay on the show. Said, don't quit. Some of you know who that fan was. Martin Luther King Jr. He told her, she said, look, I'm thinking of quitting. He said, you've got to stay on this show. This show that I can watch with my children lets us see ourselves in the future. So many of these other movies and television shows and books pretended that we just suddenly at the end of the 20th century died. We just went away. Stop being a problem for people who didn't like us. This was one of the first shows that said, no, you are going to be there in a command position. And here's where science fiction produces the future. There was a young lady watching this program. She said, I want to be like her. So she became a medical doctor. And then she decided to go all the way and become an astronaut. Her name was Dr. Mae Jemison, and she flew on the space shuttle. So just by creating these images, how many people changed their lives? All right, our people appearing in many of the shows inspire many of the people through a lot of Star Wars and Star Trek and many other shows. But of course, you know, I'm happy when we're the ones who are doing the creating ourselves. But yes, even showing up in, in Thor Ragnarok with this trip act right here. So we've been making art forever. Some of you know the great artist Aaron Douglas who produced these paintings. A brilliant artist of the Harlem Renaissance. And you see, especially on the left, this vision of a future that's technotopian and it is drawing upon ancient Egypt. No contradiction because it is all us. It is all us then, now, and in the future. We look over here, so many other terrific artists such as Deji, Dej, and uh, producing computers here, the, the Dillon family, Leo, Diane, and their, uh, their children, uh, great painters uh, showing us African histories. Digital artists such as Mavinia Mav, uh, this comic book creator, Paul Louise Julie, in his great series, it's actually, the pack is a, um, a werewolf story set in ancient Egypt. And Johansa is a, a space epic. So stuff I would have done anything to, to see when I was a kid, and I'm glad it's being done now. And some of our writers and artists are working right in Marvel Comics to make superhero families and the new Iron Man, who is called Iron Heart. Uh, Blade, Black Panther, uh, Black Panther much even written by Reginald Hudlin, who is a great uh, African-American filmmaker, and he worked in comics, and uh, Captain Marvel on the right. Books. I used to think that we were only writing science fiction, Afrocentric science fiction, Afrotopian work in the 1960s, but I learned that in fact, we've been making science fiction, Afrocentric science fiction, since the 19th century. Martin Delaney worked with Frederick Douglass to create the newspaper, The North Star. He wrote a novel called Blake, or the Huts of America, that envisaged an African-American and Afro-Cuban socialist revolution to change the future. That's how long we've been making these stories, because we knew they had such importance for our peoples. This sister, Pauline Hopkins, she created the Wakanda before Wakanda. Born in the 19th century, she created this book right here, Of One Blood, and it imagined a hidden Ethiopian kingdom of high technology. Black Empire, uh, a serialized novel in the 1930s, I think it ran in the Chicago Defender, imagining uh, a super scientific, Afrocentric global plan to take over the world, led by Dr. Belisarius. And apparently the writer, George Schuyler, was a conservative. He, was, he envisaged his book as a way of mocking Marcus Garvey. His audience didn't care. They just loved it as it was. And the last laugh was on George Schuyler, because this story went on to inspire many people. The great Octavia Butler, probably one of the most influential science fiction writers ever, and in particular, Afrotopian, and this is a sister who was one of you know, the most important. So by all means, check out her work. Uh, other writers, Charles Saunders, an African-American who moved to the Maritimes and is now an African-Canadian and wrote a, a book called Imaro and many other novels set in an alternate fantasy Africa. Uh, Nnedi Okorafor, a, a Nigerian-American science fiction fantasy writer who's achieved great acclaim, including winning the Hugo Award, the highest award in science fiction. Stephen Barnes, writing Zulu Heart, 
an alternate history in which Africans enslaved Europeans in North America. Now, I'm not recommending that. <laughs> His novel is not pro-slavery, but it is a way for people to imagine and understand that we often think that things worked out the only way they could have worked out, and it's not true. History is the result of a lot of plan and a lot of accident. And it's actually it's because of global temperature changes that uh, Northern Europeans didn't conquer the world because their ports froze over. If that hadn't happened, England wouldn't become what it did. So many things could have worked out differently. Brown Girl in the Ring. I hope some of you know Nella Hopkinson. The sister used to live in Toronto, African Canadian, Jamaican roots. Some of you know her. Okay, and she is one of the most significant of all of Afrotopian writers. This book imagines a future Toronto as a failed state in which a young sister has to draw upon the power of the ancient Nigerian gods in order to save herself and her world. And I particularly love this because her hero in this book is the only hero I've ever encountered anywhere who before she could go off to fight the bad guys, had to arrange a babysitter for her little girl. <laughs> like many more books. So how can you be an Afrotopian? All right, so the first thing is learn from real world geniuses. So here's three, these people are so amazing that they might as well be science fiction characters. On the left is Chef Antajo, the brilliant Egyptologist He's from Senegal. He also was a nuclear physicist. He did some of the most important work in reestablishing the awareness that ancient Egypt was an African civilization. Both the great book, uh, 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 Af The African Origin of Civilization, Myth or Reality. In the middle, uh, Wangari Maathai, the first East African woman to earn a doctorate in the sciences. What an amazing woman. She was a pro-democracy activist, an ecologist, she was, of course, a scientist. She uh, joined the Kenyan parliament, but one of the ways she got her start was advising rural women on which plants to grow as a source of medicine, which plants would feed their families the best. She began to notice that deforestation was destroying Kenya. So she recruited women to plant trees, trees that would not only save the land from being turned into a desert, but which would be a home to animals a home for beekeeping so that she could put women to work in successful careers, tending to bees, raising honey, the foundations of ecotourism in Kenya. And because it was a green stretching across the beauty of Kenya, she called it the Green Belt Movement. This movement of women that empowered them planted 51 million trees in Kenya. The global Green Belt Movement has planted more than one billion trees. She won the Nobel Prize and the Wright Livelihood Award, which is considered the ultimate Nobel Prize. Author of books, a Kenyan parliamentarian who faced repression from the uh, corrupt president, Daniel Arapoy, and kept on fighting. What an amazing hero. And one of my daughters also has her middle name, one guy. On the right, Dr. Mo Ibrahim a techno genius who helped build British Telecom and turn it into a major telecom power, he decided, well, what am I working all this in Europe for when I should be going to Sudan and improving the lot of my own people there? So he went around seeking investors. They all laughed at him. They said, oh, why would we put any money into Africa, forgetting there's one billion customers there? So he found a way to raise the money somehow, Successful, uh, successive rounds of raising capital. He found that there were many countries, like the Congo, 60 million people, had literally only a few thousand landlines. Imagine trying to raise a successful business when you can't call almost anybody in the whole country. When he started off, and one thing is, if you want to build telephone lines across the whole continent, the second largest continent on the planet, that's going to take forever. So he said, let's go straight to mobile. When he started off, in the entire African continent, this is about 24 years ago, there were only 2 million SIM cards in operation. He built his company, Celtel, to the point that with competition, there were 128 million SIM cards in use. 
And now there is, at the last count that I did in 2012 was that there were 650 million SIM cards being used. There's a direct link. That is worth a plug. There's a direct link between what we call telephony. How many people can use telephones and an economy? So you raise this and you raise this. It's also extremely important for monitoring elections so that in countries such as Zimbabwe and others, you cannot trick people because they can simply go to polling stations, take photographs, communicate with reporters, and keep governments in check. He sold his company for $3.4 billion. He did not buy a giant gold chain. <laughs> What he did was, he did something that some people would consider the least sexy thing that you could do. He established a statistical bureau. You think, that might sound like a head scratcher. But any person in here in education, in engineering, in business knows, if you can't measure it, it's like it doesn't exist. So by forming the world's greatest statistical bureau for every aspect of life across the entire continent, in women's rights, in infant mortality, in healthcare, in openness of government, in safety of investment, in roads, in technology, he created a super race, by which I mean, like the, the, the uh, like a game show, uh, with the amazing race, that's what I'm trying to say. Every country would now compete to be the best investment climate. So this meant that people simply open up his it's called the Mo Ibrahim Index on Government, on African Governance. They open it up and they say, this country looks like a great place to do business. This has driven an economic revolution across the continent. He's also awarded the Mo Ibrahim Prize for African Leadership. You know, if you retire as a Prime Minister of Canada, there is endless money for you. Endless. Retire as President of the United States, you can be paid a million dollars to give a speech. You retire as the president or prime minister of an African country, and they might say to you, don't let the door hit you on the way out, can we call you a taxi? So, so many of these people are in a position where when they leave office, they don't have the opportunity to make a fortune. This encourages corruption. And Mo Ibrahim himself said, stop blaming all the corruption on us. Who is the one offering the bribes? So, he established the world's biggest prize, the Mo Ibrahim Prize for African Leadership, $5 million. It goes to an African president or prime minister who resigns uh, after successful work, but it has to be world class, changing the country for the better. In fact, it is such an elite level of accomplishment that almost no leader of any country anywhere in the world could qualify, so they sometimes don't even give out the prize. But the people who have won, like Festus Mohai of Botswana, lifted the whole country up. So this has resulted, and he not only gives the money for themselves, but money so that they can establish their own foundation to do their own great work. So that is a world changer, doing it through commerce and technology. You read up on these people, you'll never stop being inspired. There's great institutions like the African Leadership Academy as well as the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences in uh, Johannesburg. Check them both out. You can find out great videos online, uh, including uh, the African Leadership Network and TED Talks. Just look these up, find the videos. There's so many more that we don't have time to get to, so I'm going to speed through. Uh, anything that you love, any one of your passions, just Google that and add the name of an African country. Because if you love animation or video games, you can find great studios doing awesome stuff in places like Kenya, and also uh, in exporting a show like this to BBC called Tinga Tinga Tales. All right, uh, many people. It's so popular to do this kind of work that there's big Facebook groups just on people who are, are amateur artists because they're looking to join the industry. You got uh, great people doing awesome work being accomplished, as well as video game studios. Uh, doing African-oriented stories in many different countries, Nigeria, Congo, and elsewhere. And you know, if you just watch the news we get here, all you're still going to get is one sad story after another about us. 
Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't do things to change those, that sadness. What I'm saying is if you let somebody else tell you that you're nothing but misery, that's what you'll live down to. If you control the images and see yourself as brilliant, you'll live up to that, and your kids will too.